Shaba. And maybe before, I think because the guest, um, rather the chairperson has already introduced me, but maybe let me just go into the happenings of today to welcome this public, you all to the public lecture. And I think as students, as civilians, whatever or whoever you might think you are in society, we are always faced with so many problems, social problems. There are so many events that are taking place in societies, activities that one cannot explain. And it is our responsibility as academics to form part of those discussions. We should be in the front line of all solutions if I may put it, of the problems that we encounter as a country. And I believe that our guest speaker today is going to do exactly that. As the theme in itself says, South Africa in 2023, making sense of the current conjuncture. So I have no doubt in my mind that we will be informed about current affairs. We will not be amongst those that are behind, but instead we will be amongst the ones that are current, providing current solutions and knowing what are the root causes of some of these challenges we continue to face as a country. I think that will be all from me. Welcome again, relax, learn from this public lecture and then go back home or even in your classes and share with other students in the community. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gogo Lulu. Can you please give her another hand of applause? Thank you very much. Uh, normally, Prof. Shai always says there's no donorship in scholarship. There's no inheritance of chieftaincy in scholarship. He says scholarship as a wundun. These words, they pierced in my heart. And whenever I feel like I want to get lazy, I remember the donorship issue. So uh, by these words, I want to welcome Dr. S.L. Vuma, and Dr. S.L. Vuma is a senior lecturer in history in Department of Cultural and Political Studies. Dr. S.L., please come and welcome our guest. A round of applause. Uh, thank you. Uh, program director uh, to our acting director of the School of Social Science uh, Dr. Lulu Makola uh, to our head of department in the Department of Cultural and Political Studies Professor K. B. Shai uh, to all members of staff in the university but most importantly to our primary stakeholders who are the students receive my greetings and all protocol observe. Uh, my role here is very simple, uh, yet uh, difficult in implementation. I'm here to introduce the guests, our guest speaker. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce a son of the soil, a man with unparalleled academic credentials, a man who's loved by many 
but hated by few. <laughs> A man who's known, famously known, to make the comfortable uncomfortable. The man who's famously known to speak truth to their power. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce a man who's so flamboyant, so charismatic, so appealing, and charming both intellectually and physically. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this man has a BA honors from the University of Transkei, an MA in philosophy from the University of Ibadan, an MPhil from the Center for Studies in Social Science in Kolkata, a, a PhD from the University of uh, Witwatersrand, and he has taught at Forte and Vets, and he has held a visiting fellowship at the African Studies Center in Leiden, in the, uh, in the uh, Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, the man I'm introducing is the man whose academic journey was never restricted by the borders of South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the man I'm introducing is the man whose academic journey was never restricted by the borders of South Africa. Is the man who have traveled the world, is the man who have been in different countries throughout the world, who survived under different conditions throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, allows me to introduce to you Dr. Loazi Lushaba. trying to work out how this arrangement works with my notes, but it's fine. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank most earnestly the Department of Cultural and Political Studies for inviting me, particularly the head of department, a good old colleague, uh, Professor Khotato Shai, the director of the school, Thank you very much for the kind words earlier on and now welcoming me to the University of Limpombo, what then we knew as Teflu. So Teflu, I went to a homeland university that was called the University of Transkai. Uh, Teflu was, you know, our contemporary in the north. So there was something about homeland universities, particularly Transkai and Teflu. We competed at two levels, politically and intellectually. We thought at Transkai that we had the most, we had the best, you know, cadres, and Teflop thought that it produced the best cadres. We thought we had the best scholars. Teflop thought the same. So it's good to be back here after so many years. In order to maximize time. Chair, thank you very much. Allow me to state that my being here today is a culmination of efforts by a number of 
good people, particularly fellow black people. Mishuri Nguna, who's not here, who conceived, who convinced us all, not just about the possibility, but the necessity of this visit. For his intuitive foresight, I do wish to thank him most earnestly in absentia. For three months, Mkabadeli, Dr. Zadla, handled all aspects pertaining to this visit and drove processes drove the processes leading to it with the attentiveness marked by, marked by an unmistakable black sensibility or ethic. Absent in his efficient drive to join together the logistical dots were the social dispositions of individuals in bourgeois professions like the academy. One of the things you would soon learn is that people in the academy have very distinct bourgeois sensibilities and they want to be treated in a certain way and insist on a certain kind of protocol when you relate with them. My relations with Dr. Zadla were marked by a welcome absence of that ethic. So at the end of my interactions with him, my conviction that an academy with a different ethic is possible was indeed reinvigorated. Lastly, Chair, allow me to thank everyone present here today. You all elected to be here rather than go attend to many existential problems that define the life of a black person in South Africa today. I can only hope that our being together in thought this morning adds a moment of meaningfulness to being black in the world. Unfortunately, after such inspiring preliminaries, I now have to begin, and I have to begin by admitting that the motivation for my musings this morning come from a very unhappy place. The source of my thoughts this morning is rather the uninspiring figure manufactured by the bourgeois press that figure of the political analyst. Let me restate. The source of my reflections with you this morning is a rather unhappy one. And I've say, as I've said, that source is that figure manufactured by the bourgeois press, that figure of the political analyst. This figure of the political analyst at once aspires towards the promise of a celebrity status. It peddles fiction of objective, rational explanations whilst mistaking journalistic commentary or reportage for thought. As I said, unfortunately, it is this particular figure of the political analysts as you see them always on TV, you listen to them on radio. These are people whose identity is basically not their own, but it is given to them or borrowed to them by the bourgeois press. And as you can see in their appearance, there is an unstated aspiration towards a celebrity status. And they do so or aspire to that celebrity status by peddling what I want to call the fiction of objective rational explanations. And they mistake journalistic commentary or reportage for thought. So put simply, the figure of the political scient of the political analyst, not scientist, the figure of the political analyst has no conception of society. It has no conception of society as a complex whole wherein always exists an articulation of concrete constellation of contradictions existing in a historically determinate way. 
This political analyst, all that it does best is to reel out journalistic or empirical facts about corruption, about service delivery, without a conception of society. And it mistakes precisely that what I call journalistic commentary, it mistakes that for thought. Because in order to be able to explain problems of society, this figure must have first a conception of society, as I've said, a conception of society as a complex whole, wherein, as I've said, always exists an articulation of a concrete constellation of contradictions existing in a historically determinate way. All what this figure feeds us, aided by the press, are bourgeois anxieties and modernist sensibilities. It pelts us with presentist journalistic reportage, as I've said, as a substitute for thought. So irritated or iked by this unfortunate development, I have elected today to discuss with you guided by the following thematic, which is South Africa in 2023 making sense of the current conjuncture. It's not quite the conjuncture as the title says. It's actually a very specific formulation. It's the conjuncture, but would make it clear as we proceed. Why did I settle on this theme, South Africa in 2023, making sense of the current con conjuncture? It is because of my observations of how in the bourgeois press, all that you get a sense is happening in South Africa is corruption, is failure of service delivery, and all the other things that the political analysts mention. Indeed, these things are true, but when taken out of a historically determinate situation, they then become empirical facts without context. How did we arrive at a point when this is the objective condition, is what these journalistic you know, reportages do not tell us. So as I said, irritated by this unfortunate development, I have elected today to discuss with you, guided by the following thematic, South Africa in 2023, making sense of the current conjuncture. At face value, my title may be taken as an invitation for a commentary on the continuing politics of the presence. However, it is not. Rather, it is an attempt to make sense of the current conjuncture. It is an attempt to analyze or to answer the question, what is the current conjuncture at the present historical moment? To try and simplify, the object of my discussion with you this morning is to answer the question, how may we organize, first organize, secondly articulate, and thirdly make sense of the innumerable empirical political developments of our time. To restate, what we're going to try and answer here is how do we organize, articulate, and make sense of the innumerable empirical political developments of our time found in journalistic descriptions. So, Chair, to reiterate, the title of my talk this afternoon, or rather this morning, is South Africa in 2023 making sense of the current conjuncture. In this title, there are two conceptual formulations I suspect we must of necessity first explain in order for us to be in a position to adequately answer the question. And these two conceptual formulations are South Africa in 2023, and the second is the notion of the current conjuncture. These are the two conceptual formulations that I think first we must be able to understand properly in order for us to be able to proceed. 
there are a condition of possibility for us making sense of our task this morning. So to start with South Africa in 2023, or South Africa in the continuing present, this is not a reference to an empirical real or an empirical existent whose essence is a pure immediacy. I'm not referring to a South Africa as an empirical real or as a concrete fact. I'm referring to South Africa that is not visible to the physical eye. Again, to restate, South Africa in 2023, or South Africa in the continuing presence, is not a reference to an empirical real or an existent whose essence is a pure immediacy. You see, this box here has a pure immediacy. It's immediately in front of us. You know, we can empirically point at it. South Africa in 2023 that I'm concerned with does not have that pure immediacy. It does not have that empirical immediacy. But let us continue. And this a general everyday problem into a scientific problem. Let me risk it. South Africa in 2023 is a theoretical formulation that enables us to translate or transform an everyday general problem into a scientific problem. To explain, South Africa in 2023, for the purposes of our discussion, is not an empirical referent visible to the naked eye. If it helps, it is best to think of South Africa in 2023 as a result or as a logical culmination of a scientific theoretical practice. The South Africa of 2023 I'm talking about is a logical outcome of a scientific theoretical practice. It is not an empirical referent that is obviously available. So as I said, South Africa in 2023 is a culmination of a scientific theoretical practice which transforms South Africa from an empirical into a theoretical existence. Why not? All of this will become a little clearer as we proceed. Perhaps we must now try to explain what meaning we intend through this empirical referent that we have since been, or that has since been elevated to a theoretical existence. South Africa in 2023 is a metonym. Its meaning is discoverable through comparative scientific theoretical practice because its meaning lies outside of itself. It lies in the constellation of concrete colonial social relations it gives expression to. Basically, South Africa in 2023 is a space where you find this constellation of colonial social relations being given expression to. So South Africa that is available to the naked eye is nothing but a playground where you see the colonial social relations play themselves out. So it doesn't help then to look at the South Africa that is available to the naked eye because it is nothing but a playground that makes available or rather that makes possible the more significant political developments in the country. So as I said, South Africa in 2023 is a metonym because its meaning is discoverable through comparative scientific theoretical practice. And its meaning lies outside of itself. 
in the constellation of concrete colonial social relations it gives expression to. Its meaning put differently shows itself through an examination of the relations between different elements constitutive of a particular configuration of the social. Its meaning of South Africa in 2023 shows itself through an examination of the relations among different elements constitutive of a particular configuration of the social. And this configuration of the social is what we often refer to as a secular colonial society. This configuration of the social is what we often refer to as a settler colonial society comparable to other settler colonial societies like America, like Namibia, New Zealand, and several other settler colonial societies. So South Africa in 2023 basically is an expression of a particular configuration of the social. And that configuration of the social is marked by a certain kind of social relations you find in all settler colonial societies. Now we have learned, for those who study anthropology, have taught us that particularly through the Marxian anthropologist Georges Belandia. It is Georges Belandia, a Marxist anthropologist, who teaches us that in settler colonies, it is the everyday social relations between the white settler colonizer and the black colonized that are accepted as the phenomena revelatory of, <clears throat> revelatory of the most fundamental relations comprising it. So what George Spelandia basically teaches us is that in all settler colonies, it is the everyday social relations between the white settler, the white settler colonizer to be more specific, and the black colonized. It is these relations that are accepted as the phenomena revelatory of the most fundamental relations comprising a settler colonial situation. Now, for people who live in these parts and study in these parts, you may already be saying in your mind, but our everyday relations at Tefrop are not so much marked by the relationship between a white settler colonizer and the black colonizer. I dare say that they actually are, because the first question you would have to answer is, why is it, if South Africa is an open democratic society, why is it that there are no white students at Tefrop? in large numbers. It is itself indicative of the nature of the relations between the white settler colonizer and the black colonizer. So the absence, the physical absence of the white settler colonizer does not mean that your everyday social relations are not marked by that interaction between a white settler dominant identity and a subordinated black colonized. So, as I said, George Spelandia teaches us that in settler colonies, it is the everyday social relations between the white settler colonizer and the black colonized that are accepted as the phenomena revelatory of the most fundamental relations comprising this society. Which is basically to say, South Africa in 2023 is a settler colonial social formation, whose essential feature or whose primary features are based on the relationship between one group of people and another. And this relationship between one group of people and another is always already a racial relationship. What I'm trying to suggest to you 
is that the most fundamental aspect of social relations in any settler colony, including South Africa, is the relationship between the white settler colonizer and the black colonized. And this relationship is always already a racial relationship. So there is no possibility in a settler colonial relationship where the relationship between a black person and a white person is a normal relationship between one human being and another. That relationship is always already a racial relationship because the code that governs that relationship is a racial code. But we'll explain. So as such, the most basic relations constitutive of settler colonial of the settler colonial configuration sorry the most basic relations constitutive of the sort of the settler colonial configuration of the social is a relationship between the white settler colonized colonizer and the black colonized the relation and the fact must never be lost to us. These relations between the white settler colonizing society and the black colonized are invariably relations of domination and subordination. These relations between the white settler colonizer and the black colonized are invariably without choice. This is not dependent on individual volitions of white people and black people. That relationship is from up initial a relationship or a relation of domination and subordination. All of what this means is that the reality of colonialism in settler colonies is primarily readable from everyday racial relations between the dominant settler and the dominant black colonizer. To reiterate, the reality of colonialism in settler colonies is primarily readable from everyday social relations between the dominant settler and the dominated black colonized. As such, in order to reveal the real dynamic of settler colonies like South Africa, in order to reveal the real politics of settler colonies like South Africa, like United States of America, it is necessary to turn to the everyday racial relations of the white settler, of white settler dominance and black subordination. There is no other way of making sense of politics in settler colonial societies other than turning to everyday social relations or racial relations between the white settler dominance and black subordination. Because everything you are trying to explain in a settler colonial society is already solid or tainted with these racial relations of white dominance and black subordination. There is nothing possible. I teach first year students at UCT and because they come from white schools and they think they've had white friends, you know, I introduce them to race and racism and I ask them whether it is possible to have white friends and then, you know, they jump in excitement and say it is. And I suggest to them that it is actually not possible because the relations between a white person and a black person in a settler colonial society is are relations of dominance and subordination. And so if you are involved in that kind of a relation as a black person, you are involved as a subordinate. And for a white person, that relationship is an expression of dominance. Now that's fairly easy to prove. You don't need to think hard. In those relationships, who acculturates to whose culture? It is the black person who acculturates into the white person's culture. You learn their culinary habits, you know, you learn to speak like them, you are friends for 10 years, they never learn your language, you learn their language. That's not friendship. It's not reciprocal. <clears throat> this 
of course, is not to deny, so to get back to where we are. The point I was making is that in order to reveal the real dynamic, the real political dynamic of settler colonies like South Africa or America as social systems, it is to the everyday racial relations of white settler dominance and black subordination that we must tell. This, of course, is not to deny the existence of other forms of social relations, be they ethnic, be they religious, be they class relations. When we say that racial relations between white settlers and the black colonized are the most fundamental or revelatory of the fundamental dynamic of settler colonies, it's not to deny that there are other kinds of social relations which may be ethnic relations, religious relations, or other kinds of relations. Neither is it to deny other elements of the settler colonial complex, be they economic, be they social, or administrative. However, the point this is meant to drive home is the fact that race and racial relations are the a priori determining condition one must first assume in order to make sense of the colonial situation in its fullest concretion. Race and racial relations are the a priori determining conditions one must assume in order to make sense of the colonial situation in its fullest concretion. So even in your attempt to explain ethnic relations, the first thing you have to assume a priori is race and racial relations, because the ethnic identities people today parade and claim are actually white colonial creations. Being Motswana, being Soto, being a, a petty person, being Shangan, being Zulu, being Kosa, all of these are colonial creations. And so the first thing you have to assume in order to make sense of settler colonial societies is race and racial relations because they are determinant of every other kind of relation. This is where, of course, we differ with Marxists who assume that it is class that is determinant or the economy that is determinant. In South Africa or in any settler colonial society, you are, as Fanon says, you are rich because you are white. You are white because you are rich. It is not because of your class position that you are rich. New York Times had a very interesting article some few years ago. And the article, or rather the title was The Arrogance of an Average and Mediocre White Man Equals Being Rich. That's all you need in America. You need to be an average or mediocre white male, and you've made it in society. <laughs> On the basis of your racial identity. So the point I'm making is that even in an attempt to explain other social elements or other elements of a settler colonial configuration, what we have to assume as a priori determining conditions are the race, are race and race relations. These other relations, be they ethnic or religious relations, and these other elements, be they economic or administrative, these other elements of the complex totality can therefore never be understood as phenomena in their own right. You cannot study or understand ethnicity on its own as a phenomena in its own right in a settler colony outside of racial relations. So these other elements, in order to make sense, these other phenomena, and in this instance I must say because, as I said, the motivating factor for my talk this morning was this unfortunate figure of the political analyst. These other phenomena, including corruption, including poor service delivery, must necessarily be related to the whole because the colonized black society and the colonizing white settler society 
together form an entity or a system wherein all the contradictions, all the antagonisms, and all the disjunctions gain their meaning in relation or in reference to. And this system is a system of racialized social relations and practices. To make that a little clearer, the point you're making is that in order to understand corruption, to understand service delivery, poor service delivery in a settler colonial society, those phenomena must first be related to the whole, which is the society. Because the colonized black society and the colonizing white society or white settler society form a system. And in this system, all contradictions, all antagonisms, and all disjunctions gain their meaning in relation or in reference to the system of racialized social interactions and practices. So everything in a settler colonial society gains its meaning in relation to or in reference to a system of racialized social interactions. I'm sure you will now be able to make sense then of why it is that there are no white students at Teflo. Because everything in a settler colonial society gains its meaning in reference or in relation to a system of racialized social interactions and practices. So for a white student, there is a system of practices that says, I can't pick up an application as a matric student and apply to Teflon. Nothing physically stops them. But there is a cultural barrier that says that to a white student, I can't fill a form and apply to be a student at the University of Zulule. Why? Because in a settler colonial society, everything else gains its meaning in relation to or in reference to a system of racial relations and practices. And this system of racial relations and practices says to them, you would have gone against the practices of society if you went there. I suspect we have said enough about South Africa in 2023 as a theoretical formulation whose meaning lies outside of itself. I suspect what bears attention now is the second formulation key to our reflections this morning, which is the notion of the current conjecture. So credit for our notion of the current conjecture we owe primarily to Azuze and Lenin. It is Althusser and Lenin, the philosophers who know better, who gave us the concept of the current conjecture. But what do we mean by the notion of the current conjecture? Overly simplified, the notion of the conjecture means the coming together or the simultaneous expression of what initially appears like discrete factors or developments, which together lead to or create an objective condition or a historical situation or a historical contradiction. Let us again reiterate. The notion of the conjecture basically means the coming together or the simultaneous expression of what initially appears like discrete factors or developments which together lead to or create an objective condition or a historical situation or a historical contradiction. If you put together what initially appears like unrelated developments, but these developments, unrelated as they are, when they are present together, when they are present together or when they are given expression to at the same time or simultaneously, they create what we call a historical condition or 
what we call an objective condition or a historical contradiction. Maybe this will become simpler. If you give expression to poverty, and you give expression to high levels of unemployment, you give expression to high levels of revolutionary education at the same time. These factors, unrelated as they may be, once they are present together at the same time, they create an objective condition or a historical situation or a historical contradiction. This is what we mean simply by the notion of a conjecture. So in simple terms, when we answer the question, what is the current conjecture in 2023, we are going to be saying, what are these discrete factors that appear together and what is the objective condition they give rise to? So what the notion of the current conjecture as currently preempt, or rather as currently posited, Let's start again. But the notion of the current conjecture, as currently posited, preempts or forecloses, is the possibility of any social problem, be it corruption, be it service delivery, be it state failure, be it crime, it precludes or preempts the possibility of all of these social problems being made sense of outside of any concrete historical and social situation. So what the notion of the current conjecture basically does is that it preempts or forecloses the possibility of any social problem, be it the problem of corruption or safest delivery, it preempts that problem being made sense of outside of any concrete historical and social situation. Put differently, social and political problems of society never present themselves as abstract are historical developments comprehensible outside of the total structure of the social body in which they are found. All social problems and political problems of society never present themselves as abstract or historical developments comprehensible outside of the total structure of the social body in which they are found. It is crucial then that the notion of the current conjecture not be confused with the pedestrian statement of what merely exists or it must not be confused with runaway empiricism, typical of journalistic descriptions. You would find in descriptions of society today that people think that they've made the most useful explanation by reciting as many problems as it is possible to recite. So the more problems you tell us of, you think you've given us the more cogent explanation of where society is. What the notion of the current conjecture suggests is that there is no possibility of any social problem or political problem of society presenting themselves as abstract or historical developments that are comprehensible outside of the total structure of the social body in which they are found. So when you tell us of corruption in South Africa in 2023, what you must alongside that tell us is the total structure of the social body in which that problem is found. And how that problem may be an expression of the basic social relations of that society. If it will help, a crude example. So if you want to explain corruption in South Africa today, it would be an uneducated explanation to tell us that there is rampant corruption amongst the political elite without telling us that in a post-colonial settler society that South Africa is, you have two avenues of accumulation. The private sector, which is basically a preserve of white people. 
And because the private sector is a preserve of white people, where does the nationalist and the political elite go to accumulate? And by the way, accumulate in order to feed values that have been taught to it by the white bourgeois class. So where does it go to accumulate because the private sector is close to it? It primitivizes the state. It uses the state in order to accumulate because the expectation is that as the elite, they must live precisely the same lives as their role models, the white elite. So in order for them to belong to this class together as the elite, they must have the same taste. You would see the white elite, or rather the black elite in South Africa, one of the things noticeable about it is that it has no values of its own. There is nothing about it that is autochthonous, that is independent. What it consumes, what it dresses, what it considers to be leisure, what it considers to be good life is all a mimicry of white life. And so the problem of accumulation has to be returned into the society that gives expression to it. So it is crucial that the notion of the current conjecture, as I said, not be confused with the pedestrian statement of what merely exists, or it must not be confused with runaway empiricism typical of journalistic descriptions. So in order to discipline our understanding of the current conjecture, we must think of it, or we must think of the conjecture as an accumulation and exacerbation of contradictions which together lead to a determinate objective condition. So you, when you have these discrete or isolated developments we spoke of earlier, which I now call an accumulation and exacerbation of contradictions, when you have them piled up on top of each other, Together they lead to what we call a determinate objective condition. So the notion of the current conjecture, unlike a constellation of empirical facts, specify the existence of the society or the complex whole in a determinate situation. What the notion of the current conjecture tells is the complexity of life in a particular social formation. Its social relations at a given historical period, it tells us of the many contradictions that are constitutive of the whole. So Althusser, a French Marxist scholar, in a typically test formulation, says that the current conjecture connotes or reveals, and I quote, it reveals, I quote, a complex relation of reciprocal conditions of existence between the articulations of the struggle of the whole. Now, rather, of the structure of the whole. Now, this is a very test formulation by Arthur Zay, and I want to repeat it because it's going to be helpful going forward. He says that the current conjecture connotes or reveals the complex relation of reciprocal conditions of existence between the articulations of the structure of the whole. End of quote. Simply put, since the settler colonial society is a system, there is no contradiction that exists or can be posited in isolation from other contradictions. Which is to say that there is no social problem in South Africa that can be posited in isolation of other problems. So today you hear people talk about load shedding as if it could be understood in isolation of other contradictions in society. Let me tell you of what other contradictions it cannot be posited outside of. How many black professors of electrical engineering do you know? Who knows a black South African professor of electrical engineering in this room? I don't. 
So think of it. In order to run ESCOM successfully as a black-dominated government, you need professors of electrical engineering, isn't it? When the system has determined that skill is synonymous with being white, where are you going to get qualified people to run ESCOM? And so people run to isolate the problem of ESCOM from other social problems of society. As if the problem is just the problem of corruption. As we said, the problem in any settler colonial society is understandable in reference to or emanates from racialized social relations between the white settler and the black dominated. But this is just an example. There are other several problems that the problem of ESCOM has to be related to, not as it is spoken of today in isolation of other contradictions in society. So the point we're making is that since a settler colonial society is a system, there is no contradiction in it that can be posited in isolation from other contradictions. Each of these multiple contradictions over determine each other or they influence each other. Each of these contradictions influence each other or over determine each other. None exists as a self-contained element or a self-enclosed instance. So there is no problem that is a problem that is a self-enclosed instance such that you can understand the problem of education in isolation, for instance, from other problems in society. This thinking you find displayed in South Africa today, children stab each other at school or they smoke drugs, and then there is a supposition that you can solve the problem within the school premises. It's a societal problem. You can't run to the school and try and resolve it in the school. It is as a result of that kind of thinking that assumes that problems are self-enclosed or contradictions are self-enclosed. They are not related to other contradictions. Actually, if you really wanted to resolve that problem of crime in the school, you might as well forget the school. Once you've resolved crime in society, you've resolved it in the school. So, all what that points to is that each of these multiple contradictions over determine each other or interact with each other as not exist as a self-contained element or a self-enclosed instance. In this logic, or where the logic of the current conjecture prevails, there is no isolable empirical fact or contradiction. None has, none of these contradictions has a positive essence on its own. Each of these contradictions acquires meaning because of its relation with other contradictions. Before the children think of the kind of crime they commit in school, they learn of it in society, outside of the school. And so, these contradictions acquire their meaning in relation to other contradictions. So in this logic, or as I've said, in the logic where the current conjecture prevails, there is no isolable empirical fact or contradiction because there is none of these contradictions that has a, po a positive essence. Each of these contradictions acquires meaning because of its relation and interaction with other contradictions. So admittedly, each of these contradictions do not exist at the same level of development. It may be the case true that there is one contradiction that exists at a higher stage of development. So crime might be a contradiction that is more developed than the other contradictions. That's why we say each of these contradictions do not exist at the same level of development. So I think we have said enough to at least gain a working understanding of the two key conceptual formulations in our reflections. The concept of South Africa in 2023 and the concept or the notion of the current conjecture. I think we have a fair idea now 
or a working idea of what we mean by these two conceptual formulations. Summary put, we know that South Africa in 2023 is not an empirical fact that is visible to the naked eye. It actually has to be brought into existence through what we call a scientific theoretical practice. We are not referring to an empirical real that is out there, but we are referring to a conceptual reality. It is concrete only in thought. The South Africa in 2023 is concrete only in thought. And that South Africa, we said, as a settler colonial social formation, is defined by fundamentally racialized relations between the white settler and the black colonized. And there is nothing in society that you can try and make sense of outside of these racial relations. We try to demonstrate by showing that even though you only have black students at Teflo, that itself is determined by racial relations of the white settler dominance and black subordination. The day white people, white students come in large numbers to Teflo, it would disrupt an understanding of white people being superior and necessarily going to quote and unquote better universities. So, now that we have a fair working idea of these two concepts, let us turn our attention finally to answering the question of what is the current conjecture today in South Africa? What is the current conjecture in South Africa today or in South Africa in 2023? So to reiterate, Chair, if we think of the conjecture as an accumulation and an exacerbation of historical conditions or an accumulation of contradictions leading to an objective condition or a historical situation. The present South African conjecture I want to suggest to you this morning is made up of two principal elements or contradictions. One, it is the pitfalls of independence delivered through nationalism. That's the first element that is constitutive of the current conjecture in South Africa. All the things that we see as problems in South Africa today are nothing but empirical manifestations of the conjecture. And that conjecture, as we've said, is a conjecture that has two primary elements. One, the pitfalls, of in, the pitfalls of freedom delivered through nationalism or the limitations of independence delivered through nationalism. That's the first element. The second element is the deepening of the racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black domination. So my proposition to you, all I have traveled to suggest to you this morning, is that in order to understand the current conjecture in South Africa today, we only have to look at these two principal elements. These two principal elements are all the pitfalls of independence delivered through nationalism. Two, it is the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black domination or black damnation. Again, to reiterate, if we think of the current conjecture as, or rather if we think of the conjecture generally as an accumulation and exacerbation of historical conditions or an accumulation of contradictions leading to an objective condition or historical situation, the present South African conjecture I want to suggest to you this morning is made up of two principal elements, as I've said, the pitfalls of independence delivered through nationalism, and secondly, the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black damnation. Now, 
I know this example will not quite make the point clear, but I want to state it at this point as it will help us as we go forward. When I speak about these two elements of the current conjuncture as constitutive of the current conjuncture, the pitfalls of independence delivered through nationalism are pretty simple. What you may ask is what do we mean by the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black domination? Here I want to suggest to you that when you complain about corruption and when a white person complains about corruption, those that one thing does not mean the same thing to you, to both of you. To white people, the complaint about corruption serves two purposes. It is to affirm what modernity had long established, that black people are inferior and incapable. For black people, corruption means something else. So when you join hands together with white people to say we are fighting against corruption, we are fighting against two different things. For other people, for white people, for the white settler dominance, this is an affirmation of their superiority. If it were us, it would not be so. So there is no commonality in our understanding of this same empirical phenomenon. And so it is necessary then to return every contradiction into its social context. Because even though, because even though it may be termed corruption, once it is returned into its social context, it acquires different meanings because it then interacts with other elements in society. I thought I should state that at the beginning because it will help us as we navigate what I mean by the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black damnation. I didn't say black domination. It's the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white dominance and black damnation. Let us continue. So at this point, what we're trying to do is to make sense of the current conjecture in South Africa today in 2023. And as I've said, we want to think of the conjecture as an accumulation and an exacerbation of historical conditions or an accumulation of contradictions that lead to an objective condition or lead to a historical situation. And so the current South African conjecture as I've suggested, is made up of two principal elements of contradictions. The pitfalls of, indi of independence delivered through nationalism to the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black damnation. It is the accumulation and the exacerbation of these two historical conditions of these two contradictions which has delivered South Africa in 2023 to its present objective condition or historical situation. So my thesis this morning is that it is the interaction or the relationship between these two principal contradictions, independence, limits of independence delivered through nationalism and the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance and black damnation. It is these two contradictions, the accumulation of these two contradictions which has delivered South Africa in 2023 to its present objective condition or historical situation. Of course, it bears stating that these two contradictions over-determine each other or interact with each other to produce the objective situation. Just as it is that these contradictions do not always exist at the same level of development. 
You may see a particular problem and think of it as expressly a problem of race and racism or a problem of racial relations. Even when it appears to be a problem of race or racial relations, present in that problem are the pitfalls of independence delivered through nationalism. Because there is never a contradiction, a contradiction that appears like a self-contained whole. So just as it is that these two contradictions do not always exist, as I've said, at the same level of development. So just in case you are wondering, quite rightly so, as to where then do we look to observe the present historical situation or present objective condition of South Africa in 2023? The answer is that a historical situation or objective condition only has a theoretical existence. A historical situation or an objective condition only has a theoretical existence. It is not visible to the naked eye. It does not exist as an empirical fact. It can only be made sense of or accessed through scientific theoretical practice, particularly that part of theoretical practice which enables the transformation or the statement of a general difficulty into a scientific problem. So just in case you can think we would be able to point you empirically as to where is this conjecture, it does not exist in that sense. It is a product of a theoretical practice, scientific theoretical practice, particularly that part of scientific practice which enables the transformation of everyday problems into scientific problems. So what is observable or visible to the naked eye or what the political analysts and the journalists alike mistake for the conjecture or the objective conditions is nothing but its empirical manifestations. So what they tell us about corruption, about state failure, and the many other things they cite in their theoretically jaded descriptions, all those things are nothing but empirical manifestations of the conjecture. And you can't make sense of those empirical manifestations outside of the conjecture because they only make sense or derive their meaning from the conjecture. So you can't talk about corruption without telling us what is the current conjecture in South Africa today. So what these journalists and political analysts alike is a doctor. They can be likened to a doctor who mistakes a symptom for a disease. What they want to tell us is the problem is basically the symptom of a problem. They don't tell us what the problem is. And so in those descriptions, empirically loaded descriptions of political analysts and journalists, what we are basically being fed are empirical manifestations of the problem, but I suspect they themselves do not know what is the problem. What they are able to cite is what is visible to the naked eye. And so as I've said, this journalist and political analyst alike is a doctor who mistakes a symptom for a disease. Now if that were the only problem, perhaps it would be enough to shrug our shoulders and move on. If the problem was just that we, had very we have very badly trained political analysts and journalists, the problem would simply be easy. We could easily shrug our shoulders and move on. However, the problem is much more fundamental and much more complex. And this is very important. This is the key, second key lesson I've traveled to bring to you. It is that one of the key moments of defeat of the Black Liberation Project in South Africa 
was the moment of the onset of a tendency or inclination or conviction that the historical mission of undoing colonialism could be undertaken guided by bourgeois pragmatism rather than by the art of scientific theoretical practice. But I'm suggesting to you as my second lesson is that one of the moments of defeat of the Black Liberation Project in South Africa was that moment of the onset of a tendency or inclination to think that the historical mission of undoing colonialism could be undertaken guided by bourgeois pragmatism rather than by the art of scientific theoretical practice. Now what is the distinction between, or maybe not even the distinction, what is bourgeois pragmatism? Bourgeois pragmatism is that supposition that every problem in society could be resolved using liberal reason, which says you have two positions, let's find the middle ground and move on. So everything in society today you think you can resolve, well, there's a problem at UL of students, you know, wanting an allowance of 2,500. The university says we can only give 1,500. Okay, bourgeois pragmatism says let's bring them together, let's find the middle ground and move on. That's bourgeois pragmatism. What you do not resolve in that problem are the fundamental root causes of the problem. And so you leave the problems. With bourgeois pragmatism, you don't attend to the problem. You leave the fundamental root cause or you leave the factory from where the problem is manufactured and you want to go resolve it at a secondary level or you want to go resolve you know, the manifestation of the problem using bourgeois pragmatism. So that is why every day in South Africa you have a commission investigating the incident of racism, you know, either at Stellenbosch University or at UCT or anywhere else in the workplace. How many of these commissions are you ever going to have? Just go resolve the problem of race and racism. But because of the onset of bourgeois pragmatism, we forget that there is a historical mission of undoing settler colonialism. And bourgeois pragmatism is no match for the fundamental challenge of settler colonialism. It does not even, it does not even have a language to speak to settler colonialism. So this attempt or this inclination or tendency that crept into the Black Liberation Project to think that you could use bourgeois pragmatism to attack or to attain a historical mission of undoing colonialism. I think the onset of that inclination was the moment of defeat for the Black Liberation Project in South Africa. Because as I've said, bourgeois pragmatism is no match for the formidable challenge of undoing settler colonial modernity. In order for settler colonial modernity to be transcended and true liberation realized for the black colonized, the objective condition, the historical situation must be properly analyzed at all times. And that, by implication, makes theoretical practice primary. And that, by implication, places scientific theoretical practice at the center of any project aimed at actualizing black liberation. In simpler terms, black liberation without scientific theoretical practice is impossible. Bourgeois pragmatism is going to leave us precisely with the same structure, but we are going to be attending every day to the problems that are spawned or triggered by that structure of settler colonialism. And my suggestion is that the onset of bourgeois pragmatism was precisely that moment of defeat for us.
So, considering that I have been speaking for long, what I think I owe you at this point is a sh comments, short comments on the two principal contradictions or elements that constitute the current conjecture in South Africa today. Those two elements, those two principal elements of the conjecture we spoke about, which is nationalism, or rather the pitfalls of nationalism delivered through independence, and the exacerbation or deepening of racialized relations of white settler dominance and black damnation. So let us begin by pondering the limits of independence delivered through nationalism. Amongst other things, nationalism accepts as its own foundation the epistemological basis of Western modernist ordering of society. Nationalism is not an originary ideology. All that it does is to accept in total the model of society that the colonialists brought. All that nationalists disagree with is who should drive this model of modernization. For the nationalists, for the nationalist elite, the state as it was created, the colonial state as it was created, there's no problem with it. The problem is who runs it. So for the nationalist elite, their disagreement with the colonialists is that they thought they were the rightful people to drive the process of modernization. So all they wanted was to replace the colonial administrators. And so, if independence was a moment of triumph for nationalism, what it defeats basically are the individuals who occupied the colonial states, the white settler colonizers who occupied the colonial state. Everything else, it leaves untouched. For instance, it leaves untouched the colonially engineered structure of economic domination. It leaves untouched the structure of colonial education. So what nationalism enables, basically, is the takeover of the state by the nationalist elite without transforming it. In return, because this is a colonial state run by the black colonized, the nationalist, the nationalist elite, sorry, because this is a colonial state run by the black colonized or the nationalist elite, the purposes of this state are antithetical to the interest of black liberation. Whether it is occupied by black people or the nationalist elite, in character, the character of the state is such that its interests are antithetical to the interests of the people. As a result, this brings into existence a number of maldevelopments including corruption, as we demonstrated earlier. What is the problem of corruption? It is that the nationalist elite must accumulate because by nature, the purpose of the bourgeois is to accumulate and consume. Where it is productive in industrial capitalist society, its purposes are threefold. It produces, it consumes, it produces, it consumes, and the purpose of the bourgeois, as I said, is to accumulate and to consume. And where it's productive, it adds a third purpose, which is to produce. So, as we demonstrated, the problem of corruption is triggered by the structure of the colonial state that is now run by the nationalist elite, but remains untransformed. Because if it were transformed, Everywhere else in a mature, not that I'm advocating capitalism, but because the elite functions within capitalism, in any mature functional capitalist society, you know you want to be rich, you go to the market. In settler colonial formations, you know if you're white, you want to be rich, you go to the market. If you're black, you want to be rich, 
you go to the state. Because those are the avenues that are available for accumulation. So, earlier we made the point that racialized everyday social relations between white settler colonizer and the black colonized in settler colonialism are accepted as the phenomena revealing the most fundamental relations comprising a settler colonial society. However, with the coming of political independence, the white settler population accustomed to thinking about itself as subjects in relation to black objects suddenly finds the black colonized to be the figure from which authority flows. So now I'm transitioning for the sake of time to the second element of the contradiction, which is that with the coming of independence, of political independence, momentarily what happens is that the white settler subject, which is used to think of itself as the source of all authority and as the source of all legitimacy, suddenly is displaced by the black object that now runs the state and this black nationalist elite now presents itself as a figure of authority. There is a disjuncture. This white subject that is used to being dominant all of a sudden has to accept authority from what was previously an object of damnation. So put differently, overnight the black colonized becomes the figure from which the truth of power ensues. This is what happens with independence. In that one development, what had since the Enlightenment been established as the basis of white identity, its dominance in relation to the black, is called into question. So what independence, what 1994 did in South Africa, was that you had people who for centuries had, or who since enlightenment, had thought of themselves as being eternally superior to black people. Suddenly they find these black people to be the source of authority. They find these black people who now occupy the state to be the truth of power. And as I said, in just that one development of 1994, what had since the Enlightenment been established as the basis of white identity, which is its dominance in relation to the black, is called into question. If it were not so, Daryl Glazer, a white academic at VETS, would not have found a reason to enter the following comments in his book titled Politics and Society in South Africa. About white people in South Africa after 1994 or after political independence, this is what Darwin Glazer says. There is no precedent on the basis of which to assess their likely fate. He's talking about white people in South Africa post-independence and he says, there is no precedent in history on the basis of which to, to assess their likely fate. Post-1994 South Africa is the first black-run state to govern a large number of whites. Perhaps it will help to make this point clearer and ask, what is the source of anxiety for Darren Glazer and other white people? Why does he find it necessary to say that South Africa is the first black-run state to govern a large number of white people? Why is it necessary to make that explicit? Or what is the source of that anxiety? I can help you answer the question in the sake of time or for the sake of time. The source of that anxiety is that modernity had never envisaged a possibility of the black object authoritatively prevailing over the white subject. The design of modern society had never envisaged 
the black colonize prevailing over the white identity or the white subject. From up in issue, the white identity has been constituted as the source of all authority, but also this white subject has been from up initial constituted as self-determining, which is to say that the white identity has never known any other legitimate source of authority other than another white subject. When that authority has to come elsewhere, modernity has long answered the question that is not authority that as a white person or as a white subject, you can subject yourself to. Perhaps you are lucky here, you do not find it most. We who work in white institutions see this very well when even junior white staffers in the University of Cape Town think of themselves as superior to you, even if you are professoriate. Because modernity has long established that the white identity is always the source of all authority. Authority can come from anywhere else. And so, I will finish in a second, don't try. And so, as I've said, modernity had never envisaged a possibility of the black object authoritatively prevailing over the white subject. Otherwise, if it were not so, why would Daryl Glazer say there is no precedent in history on the basis of which to judge what would be the fate of white people in South Africa? Why doesn't he say that South Africa has become a democratic society where all citizens are going to live equally? It is because these are not citizens. These are white dominant settlers and the black colonized. And history has never decreed, and the history of thought has never decreed that the dominated black would reverse the roles with the white settler colonizer. That's the source of his anxiety. So if that is the problem then, it is my proposition to you again this morning, my third proposition to you this morning, that unhinged from its moorings for the first two decades and a half, the white settler community has in South Africa in the past four years or so been engaged in a project to restore its dominance and authority over the black colonized. From 1994, for the first 20 years of democracy in South Africa, post-1994, the white people were somewhat lost, as you can see from Daryl Glazer's anxiety, or expression of a generic white anxiety. They were somewhat lost or unhinged because they had no answer as to how does a white person occupy a position wherein authority flows to him or her from a black person. They did not have an answer until the past four years or so where they've begun a project of restoring the dominance or the authority of the white subject over the black subject. So despite the attempt to mask this rear guard fight, it has been easy to decode. And so to end off, I want to suggest to you that the sudden impulsive edge amongst white people to establish through the language of law the irrationality of the black run state governing a large number of white people has very little or nothing to do with law. All the cases you see going to court today, white organizations arguing against a black run state that is governing over a large number of white people saying that its decisions are, rash, are irrational and arguing in the courts of law to establish that this is an irrational government. All of those maneuvers I want to suggest to you have nothing to do with law. They are part of the project to reassert the white identity or the white subject as the source of all rationality and knowledge. And the black person 
as a subject of lack, lacking that reason and rationality. And the courts are helping indeed prove that, as we've always said, remember colonialism justified itself on the basis that it was a spread of the light of reason and rationality to people who lacked it or who did not have it. What the courts are saying today is basically a validation of an age-old maxim that colonialism had established. Reason and rationality flows in one direction, from white people to black people. It can never be in another way. And so, as I said, I want to end off by suggesting to you that the sudden impulse to establish through the language of law the irrationality of a black-run state running or governing a large number of whites has very little to do with law. Two, the framing in public discourse of corruption as though it were an affliction of a black government has nothing to do with governance. I enjoin you, when you live here, to go and look at the amount of money Mark Schuster of Steinhoff stole and compare it to the amount of money that every other black person in the press is being vilified for having stolen. And by the way, black people still, Steinhoff manipulates the books. The discourse is different. The code is different. These ones still, these ones have agency. They are capable. They manipulate. So it's an achievement. So I want to suggest to you that the framing in public discourse of corruption as though it were an affliction of a black government has nothing to do with a desire for good governance. Three, the juxtaposition on the one hand of a collapsing black-run state and on the other an efficient white-run private sector that is always available and ready to help or resuscitate the state also has very little to do with the desire for a functional society. It is a re-establishment again of that maxim established within modernity. It is the responsibility of white people to always help the black colonized. So the ineptitude of a black run state is juxtaposed with a functional private sector. Ask any black person here, we know how inefficient the private sector is. Our people go to banks, they are unschooled, and all the forms in the banks are in English. And then you say this is an efficient private sector. But my point is that all of these things together, all of these things that I have mentioned, all of these are maneuvers or these are parts of an effort to re-establish the truth of modernity and to assuage the anxieties of a white society which has always known itself to be the epitome of reason and rationality. All of these are efforts to re-establish or to assuage the anxieties of a white society which has always known itself to be the epitome of reason and rationality, which has known itself to be the figure from which authority emanates. And this white identity has been the subject which throughout history has been responsible for the black to identify and correct its deformities. Whether it is Helen Sussman Foundation, the South African Foundation, the purpose remains one. It is to identify and correct the deformities of the black, now running government. It is my hope that what we've done tries to render comprehensible what we mean by the deepening of racialized everyday relations of white settler dominance 
and black damnation. All of these things, I think, point us to what are the objective conditions in South Africa today and their manifestations. I thank you very much. Introduce myself this way, just as a form of, just as a form of acknowledging those who come before me, but also as a defiance to what is termed professional. We have been led to believe that being African is being unprofessional, and to be unprofessional is to be African. As I speak today, I'm not just a student and a lecturer of philosophy, but I am an African political subject. My identity and my existence is political. To be here reminds me of Ubushant, which I take as an analogy for today. In the crowd, once a man brings what we commonly know as African beer, that is shared to notify all those that are gathered as to why we are here, but also what Lebekile is for. Upon the word shared, there needs to be a respondent either to give thanks and to also acknowledge in Vanilo Zedu or what is due to us. This, in my opinion, is a, polit is a political phenomenon. I should make a disclaimer that the person who responds or the responsibility of that for those who respond is of a particular age. But today, I was given a privilege to respond. What Dr. Roshaba has done is to bring Ibeki so that things are near and quench our thirst. This is an African social imagination I wish to stem my response from. 
speaking about politics must stem from one's imagination and social reality. Hence, I would first ask my question to Ubu Dumdala. What would it mean, therefore, to speak of Africa in the 21st century and making sense of the current conjecture? A YouTube blogger by the name of Cyrus Janssen, in a video titled, Why Africa Chose China, stated that the US saw Africa as a problem it needed to fix, while China saw Africa as an opportunity. However, in the video, it was not yet carefully stipulated as to what kind of opportunity did China see Africa as, and what those um, opportunities are, including the disadvantages and advantages of such an opportunity. Why is this statement so important? Well, as we have seen in global politics, Africa has been making strides to align and strengthen relationships with China and Russia. It would seem that Africa, Africans are beginning to grow tired of the know-it-all Western doctor who's diagnose, who diagnoses us and prescribes a remedial cure. A cure that can, be, that can cripple us, taking us back to the know-it-all doctor. The African being colonized and conquered through unjust wars has been crippled by the West, and as such, the West has seen itself as a perpetual master which needs to fix the African problem through means of loans or financial aid. Africa, being impoverished, did not come from thin air. The conditions Africa finds itself are created by the West. As such, it is refreshing and perhaps even empowering to see the likes of Burkina Faso and Niger being bold in their political stance towards neocolonialism. Coming back to South Africa, it should be mentioned that I long for the day when I would witness such boldness from our leaders. We as Africans have been denied justice not only by the West, but by the colonial settler. Today, Africa is longing for the historical and corrective justice. A question I will also pose again uh, to Putumtal is, what would it take for South Africa to achieve justice? We cannot easily forget the past, as our leaders have invigorated. In Africa, Ijala Alimoli, a crime does not expire through time. As such, wouldn't it be meaningful that there must be talks and actions taken towards achieving the reparations? As Cheryl Harris in her book chapter, Whiteness as Property, talks about how whiteness cannot be inherited even when one is born either by a white mother or a father. Whiteness is a property that must be defended by all means necessary. Hence, the likelihood of Michel Foucault, who argues that society must be defended. Since whiteness is property, do you think, Doc, we should amend the law where there is property tax as a form of reparation to this property of whiteness? Our leaders have been uh, indecisive as to whether this country should go. They have been following the Western agenda where they are told what to do and how the West will solve there are problems that has been created by the West. When reading the overview of the US-Africa 
Leadership Summit held in the U.S. last year, December. You get the sense that the U.S. wants to position itself as the know-it-all doctor, where it tells Africans how to solve their problems. Blaming Russia as a form of running away from the true justice that has been done by the West. Our politics in South Africa would seem structured or confined in kissing the hand that feeds us, where the talks of political stability are rooted in the economy, where the private sector dictates the rule of engagement. And in mind, we shall think of the first time COVID hit, where our president started to have a meeting before the lockdown with the private sector. The status quo had to be instilled. It is a shame that South African leaders are no longer engaged in politics grounded in African social political imagination. Today, a king must be recognized by the president. A president, upon being sworn in, must kneel to Queen Elizabeth. but will never kneel to his king or queen in Africa. It would seem in South Africa that the role of kings and queens are secondary in our democratic society. Kings and queens must account to the president, but the president does not account to king and queens. In my mind, I'm also reminded of the debacle between with Jacob Zuma. The contestations between who is more superior than the other, the king of a nation or the president of the country. Perhaps I should ask this question, uh, Dr. Lusha. What are your thoughts on the disjuncture um, that is? African political systems vis-a-vis -vis Western imposed political systems. Stemming from the talk to analyze Africa from Western theoretical methodologies may be an injustice to African scholarship and the politics of liberation. In your view, what do we think we should do as an African scholar to respond to this injustice, even if this injustice is done by our fellow blacks, especially when the research and publication is at the hands of the colonizer. We seem as scholars that we are handicapped when it comes to issues of scholarship. And as such, I would like to thank you for coming and I thank you very much. Can you please give another hand of applause to me? Uh, now we are going to the question and answer session. We are only going to take five questions. And please, please, be brief. Don't take uh, more than five lines trying to explain one line. Be straightforward, because when we look at our watches, time is no longer on our side. So I will take only five hands. I can see I have five hands. They are enough, thank you. Uh, I will start with you, my brother, Joko. Thank, thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, I do have a question. Like, uh, 
South Africa in 2023. Remember next year we're going to the elections whereby most of the South Africans are not taking those elections serious. Uh, remember we elected people to be in power. Once they are in power, they start to enrich themselves with the expenses of the South African people. So, yes, I do have a question. Like, remember politics and economics goes hand in hand and uh, land. Land is the most important thing in this world. Like, so, Udum Dala, I want, uh, I want to ask you a question. Like, do you think maybe we do have a chance of getting our land back? Like, getting our land back since uh, when talking to politicians, they are trying by all means to avoid this conversation. Like maybe if we black people united and go and reclaim back our land, do you think maybe we will succeed or what? Since we are negatively affected by poverty and high rate of unemployment. Thank you. Thank you. I will take the second question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lwazi, I have three questions. Briefly, the first one is, in your explanation, what is colonial education? The second, I would like to just know if maybe one needs to have access to your writings, where can I access that? The last question, which is a bit lengthy, is what you were referring to the dominance and subordinance uh, being black and white. I just want to have your understanding because in my view, I think that is mostly perpetuated by the social settings that we are involved in. For example, obviously if you go to a university like the University of Cape Town, you are mostly going to be subjected to a white life. But if you come to Teflop, it's a black life. They sell black food, what normally black people will consume. Even here in the University of Limpopo, the relationship between a black student and a white student is not that of dominance and subordination. If you actually look at it, the whites are subordinate to us because they are conformed to our living conditions. So it's not fair that one would go to a country like uh, Germany, for example, and expect to be dominant in a society that is predominantly owned by white people. So I just want to have your full understanding. Isn't this uh, mostly perpetuated by the social settings that we're involved in? Thanks. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Your name is? I'm Chofa I just want to ask Doc a simple question. What is the role of the Constitution in undoing secular colonial modernity? Thank you. Yes. I'd like to pass my warmest greetings to everyone present here. Um, I have a, a question which is, in fact, dual in that it is a follow-up question. My question is, how do we make sense of the fact that uh, there are white monopoly, monopoly capitalists, that is, white capitalists that appear as they go about taking care of their economic, or rather, business enterprises that they are not so nationalistic or racial in their social outlook as they are simply capitalistic businessmen whose companies merely seek to exploit the masses in favor of these white capitalist businessmen who in fact have recruited some black friends with whom we might collectively refer to as the elite. Pondering upon such a reality, how then do we still say oppressor oppressed relations um, in, colonial, in, in colonial secular South Africa are expressive of dominant white versus subordinate black relations instead of being expressive of capitalist elite with no necessary specific color? versus oppressed lower class masses, both black and white. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll, oh, oh, please don't press the mic whenever I'm talking. I would like to take another question. I'll come to you, my brother. You with the red cap, your name and his name. Uh, okay, thanks very much. My name is Morore Skukun. 
the question is a sort of a moral question. Uh, you know, we have fear for white people and the trauma for living in Oxford. In a, in an epoch after apartheid, it's currently running out. You know, even the ideological condition that things are a reality of the current epoch, it's running out. My question is, won't there be a racial outra uh, outrageous outrage, uh, in fact, of detailed separatism, or maybe bloodshed of racial battle between us and the whites, maybe in the near 10 years, because we're starting to realize ourselves and we want dominance and power. And thank you very much. I'm taking the... But this, this side... What? I'm taking the very last question. Yes, I have seen Mr. Mboweni raised your hand. Oh, thank you very much. The colonialists are not here to implement the colonial agenda, but we here are perpetuating that agenda. Are we not complicit in academia by not changing the curriculum? I thank you very much. That was the last question. Thank you very much. Um, we have quite a number of interesting questions that I'm going to try and answer in you know, a roundabout way. So if I don't refer specifically to your question, it is not because I'm disregarding it, but in the interest of time. But as I said, I'm also going to bring together a few questions. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, I didn't get the name. Uh, there's a brother there who says we are dominant, or there are students who are dominant to white people. Did I get you right? No, basically I was saying that dominance, in my view, depends on the city where you are. I made an example with maybe living in a country like Germany, saying that you can't go there and expect to be a dominant threat in a country of that nature. But if you come to a place like Teplock where mostly it's blacks, a white person who is here is going to be dominated by us who are blacks. Thank you. So let us get this right. Part of what I... I'm trying or what I was trying to do in the talk is to dissuade us from taking instances as being representative of a system. South Africa is a settler colonial society. Like in all other settler colonial societies, the relationship between the black and between a black and a white person everywhere in South Africa, anywhere at any time, that relationship is always already a relationship of white settler dominance and black damnation. Whether it is a turf war, whether it is at UCT or anywhere in all white settler colonial societies, that's the most fundamental relationship expressive of the dynamic of settler colonial societies. You may be a numerical majority, but that does not mean dominance. White people in South Africa are only about what, nine to 10 percent, no, six to nine percent of the population. They run, they run rough short over us. We are 82 percent of this country, but we sink to their tune. The point I'm making is that the structure of dominance is not dependent on individual volitions or what we may want to feel. Even when the reality is very much disrotting or discouraging, the structure produces that reality. So, dominance does not require physical presence. The absence of white people at UL is already a sign of those racial relations in dominance and in domination. Of course, <clears throat> Of course, we're going into elections in 2024. Um, but again, I think that there is something we must be very we must be very wary of. One of the things I said was that the moment of defeat for the Black Liberation Project was when we opted for what I call bourgeois pragmatism, 
where we think that we can, by resolving a problem using liberal reason, would get somewhere. The alternative of that is to look for individual solutions or solutions to isolated problems of society. You may resolve the problem of land. Would white people respect us because we have land? Look at the example of black people who are richer than white people today who have land. Do white people respect them? The source of white superiority is not the material. It's not their wealth. Wealth and land are indeed necessary, but they are not sufficient to explain the superiority of the white identity. A poor white person knows that he or she is superior to a rich black person. Where does that superiority emanate from? It does not emanate from the wealth. It emanates elsewhere. It is precisely this elsewhere that I was trying to point out by saying that we cannot hope to achieve black liberation without a consistent and a tenacious commitment to scientific theoretical practice so that we may understand at every moment of the struggle what is the conjecture, where are we, what is the constellation of different contradictions. In 2024, when we gain land, we might have created another objective condition. So let us take the return of the land as part of those discrete factors when present with other factors, what are the objective conditions it's not going to create? Because, you see, the determinism of land is going to be a substitute for the determinism of the economy. Other people say, if you have the economy, you have everything. Ask rich black people. We save them all the time. They think money is going to defend them. When they move them there, dark beers, wars, them, them, or whatever. They run to us, we defend them. Their money can't defend them. My point, a serious point, is that the economy or the material is, is necessary, but not a sufficient condition for the liberation of the black colonized. It's not only the academy that needs to change. It's not only the curriculum that needs to change. People get into the colonial state, the settler colonial state, just like the nationalist elite took over the state and did not transform it, intellectuals or academics, professional academics, you know, because we must draw a distinction between organic intellectuals and career academics. The type we must despise always are the career academics. The ones that are interested in their individual rise within the system, those are the ones you must despise, just as, like, just as we despise the nationalist elite. So people get into the system and suddenly they profess it as their own. It's a colonial system when they are outside, when they get into it, it becomes their own, just like the nationalist elite did. So academics are indeed complicit. In fact, the shame of black South African academics is that it was the students who saw first that the curriculum was colonial. It was not the teachers themselves. Otherwise, were it not for students, there would not have been a movement to decolonize the curriculum in South Africa. Today, they are the ones who are at the forefront now, telling us about decoloniality and decolonizing the curriculum. They were not there in 2015 when we started the movement. They were comfortable teaching us the colonial knowledge. So, indeed, academics, like everywhere, are complicit in perpetuating the colonial system. That is why we must never give up the task of a scientific theoretical practice because we will then be able with it to identify who are the motive forces that can lead to change because it is not every person that way. Um, <clears throat> look, I do not think that it would help to juxtapose class and race. Just as it is that at some other times this debate extends itself into what is more important between race and gender, you know, or what is more important between class and gender. I think that in settler colonial societies, if we want to ask the question, 
What are the basis of the creation of these colonial societies? It is the colonial motive. And what was the colonial motive? It was racial. And so racism concretely is also an expression of other relations in secular colonial societies. But what I don't think is the case is that you can explicitly say that the problem is the problem of capital or monopoly capital expressing black people. So, if you were to say so, the problem would be what happens in those instances where oppression finds you know, articulation in non-market settings. Because oppression does not end in a relationship of classes. It does find itself outside of, you know, class relations. Um, the last point perhaps to make is that <clears throat> I would think differently about outreach and say that the problem we have is that there was never a confrontation in South Africa and in Africa generally between the white consciousness and the black consciousness in order for us to have real freedom. Because that confrontation was meant or would have enabled this point. I don't know how many people study literature here. This is best illustrated with Frederick Douglass's, you know, text. Um, Frederick Douglass was a slave and wakes up one morning and had a master COVID who was known to be very brutal, who would whip them at will. And one day Frederick Douglass woke up and went straight to the master as the master was about to whip his slaves in the morning. Started a fight and went straight for his jugular. He says that he held Kovi until the point that Kovi realized that his existence was dependent on Frederick Douglass, a black person. In that tussle, they reached an agreement that since your existence depends on me letting you live now, you also must realize that I'm a human being. You must never whip me from today henceforth. From that day, Covey could not live with Douglas in the same plantation. He let Covey go. The point I'm making is that until we have created a dialectic or a confrontation, a contradiction between us and white people, until white people realize that their survival and existence is equally dependent on our survival and existence, just as ours is dependent on them, that mutuality will never be restored. You can't beg for it. It will never be given willingly by white people. Until we create that, I think that outrage or rage might not quite be, because we had outrage in 2021, July unrest, it, it never it never resolved you know anything um there are many other questions but i do realize that chair we have quite a lot uh, i would be around and we can continue the discussion outside oh, the first one is from john de Hanyane. he says how have recent shift in global trade dynamics impacted South Africans' international partnership and economic outlook this year? The second one, it says, how has the country's foreign policy stance shifted in response to changing global political dynamics in 2023? The third one says, finally, what progress have uh, been made in 2023 towards improving access to education and health care for marginalized communities in South Africa. And the other one from Nechi Pepe, it says, how can we do any way, uh, how can we do away with the language of the impressor? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I have the answer to you know, the foreign policy related questions. Um, what I'm able to offer is that, you know, we have a serious challenge as black people. And until we resolve it, and this cannot be resolved through, you know, bourgeois pragmatism. One is, 
When you talk about trade, foreign trade, which companies really do that foreign trade? It is white-owned companies. So when you say as South Africa, basically you are lying to yourself. Say white people are trading with the world. I mean, there are very few black people. If you were to look in real terms, what is the percentage component of external trade or foreign trade that is in the hands of black people in South Africa? It would not be more than 4 or 5 percent. In fact, that might even be too high. So, you find yourself in a situation where you defend what basically hates you. You defend a system that is pointed away from you. Now, that is the problem of being pragmatic. What is the conjecture? Where do this foreign trend, in what context does this foreign trade take place? Because we are going to find ourselves in very untenable situations where you have to defend if, for instance, shop right is being attacked in Nigeria, we are going to say to other black people, you are attacking South African companies. You are saying to another black person in defense of a white company that you are attacking South African companies. It's a quandary that we are not going to be able to resolve pragmatically. We have to change the structure of society to be able to resolve that. So I always have a difficulty. People say, you know, South African foreign trade relations, just say it for what it is. It is white South African foreign trade exchange. The other point um, from, from the online, you know, um, sorry, what was the question? Oh, the, the, the language of the master, the language of the master. Again, I'm reminded here of, um, of, of um, Shakespeare. For those who study English, you know, you probably have read uh, what is that play, you know, with Caliban and Prospero? And no, it's not Macbeth. Tempest. Tempest. Thank you very much. Now, in Tempest, you have the slave, Caliban, you know, who exchanges words with the master, Prospero. Um, basically, the slave, Caliban, had attempted to rape the child of the master, the daughter of the master, Miranda. And... The master Prospero comes fuming at Caliban. How dare you, you know, do try and do that? I've come here to civilize you, and all you think is that you can violate my daughter. This is Caliban's response to the master. He says, Master, you've taught me language, but the benefit in it is that I can curse you. The, 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 the relationship with language the colonial languages, you know, is not a one-way relationship. We have to, I don't think we have to do our way. You know, uh, there's something else that has to do. Our own languages have to be elevated also to become languages of science. Because I think we, we get lost somehow in this debate. People say we want our languages. Um, and they do not actually go deeper. In order to have... Setswana, for instance, being a language with which you can teach medicine, you have to create the technical vocabulary within Setswana. Linguists tell us that's a process that takes about 50 years. Right? It means then that as we lose years, we're not starting. We haven't started. After 20, 29 years of independence, we've not started. It means that we're postponing further that time when we have Venda is a language with which you can teach political science. Because if I ask you now, what would be legitimacy in Venda? We haven't done that work. Now, it's not as simple as, and by the way, don't get me wrong, I'm all for elevating African languages, but what I'm trying to say, that debate must not be sloganeering. There's serious work that has to go into it. We have to produce our own linguists as black people. Again, if I ask you, how many black South African professors of linguistics do you know? There might be no one in this room who knows a professor of linguistics. Now, how are we going to you know, achieve that, that, that object? 
These things are necessary, but I think we've been sloganeering too much. There is some serious work that has to go into actualizing some of these things. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take very last two hot questions from this presentation. Please don't bring something for me from what was spoken in the house. My brother there, I think I appointed you last time. Thank you. Your name and say name. When you were speaking, I heard you were emphasizing that the only way we can understand what is happening present day is if we look at the conjecture of uh, racial tensions. But in my question, I would like to ask you, how does the African scholar who is enlightened and mental, mentally emancipated find expression within the African social and intellectual space? where we find that not only are we met with conscious black gatekeepers to the colonial establishment, but we are also dismissed by the ignorance is bliss type of black person whose inferiority complex is so deep within their conscience that it seems to be a part of their identity. And, and if I may further contextualize, how do we reconcile and establish common ground between those who have devoted themselves to the establishment of the African dream and those who have accepted and therefore enabled the eternal damnation of the African. Thank you, Kente. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tamane Tolo. Uh, doctor, my question is, uh, how does the code that's guiding the relation between the black colonized and the white settler colonizer manifest itself each and every generation? How how is it that every generation that was born, for instance, even a generation that will be born uh, in 2024, 20, uh, next year, will obviously in the future feel this sense of superiority to the black colonized? How does this manifest in each and every generation? And my second question is on the, uh, on the geopolitics uh, happening at the moment, looking at BRICS and looking at the response of South Africans and uh, not reacting in solidarity and unity uh, towards uh, South Africa, taking, uh, turning to side with the likes of Russia and China. So my, my question here is it's, it's on how do we find a common ground as people of South Africa who want to see the country changing uh, want to see a better future for the country of South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm taking the last question with the last person. No, thanks, uh, Dr. Luli and Dr. Mishaba. So, uh, my question is that I heard you mentioning Marx Lenin. Would that be certain? So, okay, it's fine. <laughs> like I'm saying, you know, it's very interesting that uh, such engagements are not only held in memorial services, but they are also brought within the realms of institutions of reality, spaces where thought should thrive. So, like you mentioned, Marx and Lenin and every, all these other philosophers, and as students of Lenin, we agree that the state, I'm saying this because you talked about class struggle. As students of Lenin, we agree that the state is an organ of irreconcilable class antagonism. And with that being said, Kwame uh, Nkrumah wrote a book which said uh, neo-colonialism, which is the last date of uh, imperialism. The Osagia for Kwame Nkrumah went on to say in that book that uh, this thing of neo-colonialism being the last stage of imperialism is yet the most dangerous state of uh, uh, imperialism. So I want to ask how dangerous it is asking from a man like you. You also talked about the, uh, the arrogance of a mediocre white man. 
So I want to ask uh, you a question to say, what's the best that we can do to defeat a mediocre and an arrogant mediocre white man? What's the best that we can do? We want to defeat them on the ballot this time around. What's the best thing that we can do next year in 2024? That's a question. So, um, lastly, uh, I mean, like, it's given that you are a, you are a, a, a instrumental or an industrial scholar. You read a lot of books. So, like, Kolobe asked the, the deck to say, where can we access your book? Now, uh, I, I, I'm just saying, Please, please donate uh, us the books that you have read, the ones that you don't want to read. We have a book club, by the way, so please uh, talk. Thank you, Dr. Nishama. Um, actually, I use library books. So when I need to read, I go to the library and I borrow books from the library. Uh, so part of the strategy must be that you know, one of the things you find very easily in black communities, you don't have to walk more than a kilometer. You turn a corner, there's a shipin. You turn another corner, there's another shipin. Imagine if you turn the corner, there's a library. You turn another corner, there's a library. Then the books would be freely available. So it means that part of the struggle in changing society must be the things that we think are constitutive of a functional society, those are the things that we must struggle for. It will, it will, it will, it will help if we had, or maybe put this differently. Part of the problem when you work, you know, on the basis of bourgeois pragmatism is that you then begin to have a trade union mentality. As students, what is the best we can get out of society? You then don't care about everyone else. What happens to the unemployed, what happens to other sectors of society, you don't care. It is what best can we get as students. We want laptops, that's all. Every other thing society must see. And it means we are not building society. It means we are posing our problem as an isolated problem. It should not only be us who have access to books. It should be a society that is learned or school. You know when you have a society that is educated, you decrease not just illiteracy in society, but you also decrease the spread of diseases. So to have an educated society is not an educational good only. If you have this kind of thinking which relates one contradiction to the other, you see that these things are related. You know, um, at a point in Cape Town, at UCT, I watched with dismay and kept quiet, you know, students were agitating that there should be buses that fetch students even if they live in the locations. It sounds noble. What we are saying is that there is a problem of public transport in the country. But you don't care about the problem of public transport in the country, you care about yourself. As long as the buses fetch us as students of UCT, the security guards, you know, who have to wake up at 4 a.m., whether they are female, you know, who are likely to be robbed, we are not saying anything about them. So I think that we must begin to think about society. We, we must not, you know, uh, be people who don't have a conception of society like you find in the general. So the books, the books are in the libraries. Um, but we must not only go to the libraries, we must... I've never heard students protest in any university and say our library is poorly resourced. Um, so I think that we must, we must get to a point where, you know, books are freely available. Um, neocolonialism, or rather neocolonialism is the highest stage of imperialism. Very correct. Neocolonialism, there are reasons why it is by Marxian scholars considered to be, you know, a dangerous stage because neocolonialism is a moment when capitalism transforms itself in its appearance such that its contradictions are not as naked as they are under an obvious imperialist stage where you have an imperial power dominating you know, the colonial societies. It is now done by remote, so to say. 
Now, the problem there is that people are likely to mistake the system as having changed when in actual fact it has adapted, you know, to the progress of capital exploitation. So its danger is its capability to morph into something else and such we don't recognize it. Now, neo-imperialism or rather uh, neo-colonialism is a good example of a phenomenon you can't access with your naked eye. You can't point at it. In order to be able to realize it, you must elevate it from a general problem into a scientific problem. And you can only do that through scientific theoretical practice. And so the importance of scientific theoretical practice for our liberation. Look, I don't think that, I, I don't think that, imagine if you were struggling against capitalism and then you realized how powerful capitalism is in the world. And remember, capitalism's power in the world today is both material and symbolic. You try and argue against the norms in capitalism, you won't get employment. You know, its power is real. But also, once you go further than that, it also has military might. All the wars America go around waging in the world, it's in defense of capitalism. But imagine if people gave up and said, look man, our enemy is too powerful. Uh, we can't, you know, struggle. I'm driving at a point where someone was saying that how do we arrive at a point where, you know, we can reach a commonality between those, you know, who think that the system, or those black people, as I said, you know, who think that the system is on our side, <coughs> and those who are on the other side. It's through political work. That requires political work. You cannot decree it, unfortunately, unlike a pastor. You can't say you are going to go to hell as a black person because you don't realize that as black people who are oppressed. It requires work of politics, work of conscientization. And one of the things about the work of conscientization and the struggle is that you must engage in it knowing that you might not be successful. You must not think that tomorrow you are going to be successful or you must also know that it might not be you that will enjoy the fruits of that struggle. They might be down the line to the next generation. And indeed it is the case that for us, for instance, as black people in South Africa, this generation that is living now, unless we want to capitulate on the side of bourgeois pragmatism, we cannot see real black liberation. We can only build the foundation for it to exist for the next generation. We have to build a new education system. We have to build a new economic system, and that will take, will run through, you know, our lifetime. We won't finish that task whilst we live. So, the last point maybe to refer to is that um, someone said, how is it that the code that guides white superiority, you know, gets passed on all the time, and people born in 2024 would also have that sense of superiority. Remember, by the way, the sense of superiority in white people is not innate, it's not biological. So if you drew blood from them, you are not going to find any gene that is responsible for superiority, no. It does not exist. That superiority is as a result of socialization. That socialization is backed by the knowledge system that exists in the world, in history, but it also it's also backed by the organization of society today. If you wake up, or if you are born in South Africa today, and you come into consciousness, you don't need much to see. Where white people live, it's clean. Where black people live, it's dead. Where white people live, there are good schools. Or people say there are good schools where white people live. When you go to the hospital looking for a specialist, the specialist is likely to be white. What does it do to you as a white person? It then tells you that I belong to a race that is superior. No one has to say it to you. Let people run to white schools. You can see the traffic. There are no white people who run to black schools. Black people run to white schools. What should it do to a white kid? In fact, soon I think they will ask black people, why don't you go to your own schools? 
You see, because for a black kid, they can see that we are a magnet. Being white is a magnet. It attracts all the good things. And all, you know, everyone runs towards this identity. So when you grow up in a situation where your identity attracts, it never repairs, and everyone else aspires towards your own attributes, then you get a sense of superiority. It's not innate, it's not biological, it's as a result of socialization, but also of the organization, you know, of society. I'm sure you probably would have heard me say this, and I'm going to say it and sit down. You know, one of the things we, we said, and said well, uh, in 2016, 2015, 2016, when we were struggling in Rhodes and Fismas 4, was that we wanted black academics to teach us. It is almost 10 years after, or maybe nine, eight years after, I say to students at UCT, you see, if white people at UCT said to us, you guys have made too much noise, take this university, run it, we are walking out, white academics, you know what will happen? We will have to go after them and beg them and say, please, we are sorry, we can't run the university without you. You know why? Because we don't have black academics. I asked you earlier, do you know a professor of electrical engineering? Those are the people we need in the university. In fact, maybe that's too much. Do you know a professor of anthropology? They say there is one. Yeah. <laughs> but the point I'm making is that I don't think that we have done the work that is going to lead us to our liberation. We talk about it deeply. And I think it's easy to talk about it. You know, I ask you now, would you stay in the university for the next 12 years? Everyone says, ah, I have to go. People are hungry at home. So who, who is stupid enough who doesn't have people who are hungry at home? And then people say they want freedom. If, you, if we desire freedom as black people, we must also behave and act like people who want to be free. And I think that there are decisions that we have to take and there are actions, conscious actions that we have to take that will lead us to that freedom. With a generation that has no sense of selflessness, we are not going to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lushava. Uh, without wasting any time, I will call uh, Dr. MC Tawani for a word of thanks. A big hand of applause. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for hanging on for this long. You are still here and we appreciate your presence. We are wrapping up. Uh, we are coming to the end of our session. Heated as the moment is, some of us will still would, um, want to have a word. However, if I do not give thanks, then I would not be doing what I have been sent to do here. So let me take the moment and appreciate uh, the UL management for granting us this opportunity and affording us the place and the platform to host this beautiful event today. Uh, in absentia, let me give thanks and gratitude to uh, our Dean, Faculty of Humanities, Professor Maudu, to the Director of School of Social Sciences, um, Prof. Sitole, uh, in absentia, we are grateful for their continuous support. We also acknowledge our acting director who was here this morning, uh, Dr. El Magula, who indeed welcomed us and made us feel at home. We are thankful for that. Ladies and gentlemen, this moment, I want to uh, say this, that often we have ideas, and those ideas, if they end up in wrong hands or you knock on doors where people are not willing to listen to take the ideas up to support they end up being uh, meaningless and void however in our instance it's not the case we have a very supportive head of department who always listens you know with the ideas that the staff members come up with he is there to support, to take up the ideas with us and run them with us. 
and in that moment, Prof. Shai Reale Bogato. Um, let me also uh, give thanks, Babutat uh, Siavonga, your efforts, your team, uh, putting this together. Ukutom uh, Dala has already mentioned that uh, you have been in talks with him for almost three months now trying to put this together. It is what it is today because of your efforts and your team, Siabong uh, Alakul. Um, working together with the philosophy team is the whole of the cultural and political studies department. There's a committee that's involved. There are people who drive here in the morning areas to make sure that the venues are open, the catering is sorted, uh, staff members, team members, you know yourself, Real level. Uh, your efforts are not going to be recognized, and we are grateful for your efforts. That is inclusive of our administrators, inclusive of the marketing team that works hand in hand with us, gives us advice, sends us WhatsApps to say, you must not forget to do this, do that, do that. We are grateful for your advice and we are thankful that you are part of us and we still hope that even in the upcoming conference you will still do uh, likewise. Uh, amongst us I see different stakeholders of the university, uh, different uh, lecturers, um, directors from other uh, schools. We acknowledge your presence. We thank you for your support, for being here. Uh, uh, we see colleagues from our sisterly department uh, of sociology. We are grateful for your presence. Uh, we are grateful for our online audience who stayed with us, asked questions, participated. Uh, we are uh, a team together, you started with us, and we are thankful that you are still with us even at this moment. But most importantly, we thank the main audience, which are our students. The heated moments made me so excited about the conference that is upcoming on the 29th to the 31st of August. Uh, the conversations that you guys are holding up are already telling us that we have a very good uh, conversation coming up in the conference and we are very excited. You know, this is just the beginning. If your question was not answered, don't be despaired. This is just the start. Bigger platforms are still coming for you guys, but we are grateful that you are here and that you participated the way that you did. And. Um, uh, last but not least, Budong uh, Tala, Dr. Luaz uh, Lushava, we are thankful for your presence. You come uh, from far, you travel this far, and you saw it worth it that you come this far to share the knowledge that you shared with us. And Siabongagakun. That in itself means Uti. That is the same even with us in this department today. It is because of your presence. And not literally just food, but food for knowledge that you shared with us. The conversations that you started today, uh, this is a build-up for uh, a conference that is coming. So you have just ignited fire. The conversations that are starting here, have started here, are definitely going to continue even outside these doors and in the conference that we are going to hold. for your knowledge, for sharing your knowledge with us. So, um, as the department, that we would like to thank you for your efforts and your presence and um, sharing what you have shared with us today. I think we must open this so that the people will see. <laughs> One, one 
day they are going to say they gave me millions. <laughs> Thank you.